talking in this session is Lavinia Gordon, and Lavinia is one of these people who actually has a degree with bioinformatics in the name, um, but it was one of the early ones when she was studying at York in the UK, and then she came out to Australia and worked at Walter and Eliza Hall and MCRI. And she is now at the AGRF, which means she has the dubious honour of being one of the few people who actually gets paid by clients to do bioinformatics. <laughs> and that's what she's going to talk to us about today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I should start by saying that my background is um, biology, physiology and pharmacology. And then I, I gradually diverged into bioinformatics. So I'm not what I would consider a pure programmer. But I do work with a team who... Um, several, several of them are pure programmers, and I got their advice when I was putting this talk together. Um, and I asked one of them what his opinion was on um, open source software and bioinformatics. And he sat and thought for a while, and he said it's frustrating. Uh, as a pure programmer, he finds most of the open source software that's written for bioinformatics really frustrating to work with. So I'm going to talk about um, bioinformatics using open source software from an applied or a commercial perspective. Um, specifically from the perspective of the Australian Genome Research Facility. So for the benefit of this audience, for people who are not from a biology background, I'd just like to give a quick definition of genomics because that's what our bread and butter is. So genomics is the use of methods, and in this case I'm really focusing on DNA sequencing and bioinformatics to sequence, assemble, and analyze the function and structure of genomes where the definition of a genome is the complete set of DNA within a single cell. And here I'd really like to emphasize that we're not just focusing on the human genome, we're thinking about the genomes of every living creature. So the Australian Genome Research Facility, or the AGRF, we're the largest national genomics facility. We're a not-for-profit organization. So although we do receive funding from clients, it all goes directly back into either research facilities um, or into equipment or um, services that we offer for clients. We're spread throughout Australia. We have five nodes, um, Brisbane, Adelaide, Sydney, Perth, and Melbourne. Our focus is on being enablers, so we try and uh, assist our clients to achieve their research goals, either through specific advice or specialized services. And last year, we worked with over 3,000 clients. The work that we undertake is incredibly diverse. Um, every branch of the kingdom of life is represented in what we do. Um, we sequence and analyze pretty much everything. We do really work on everything. So for a bioinformatician, this is like a candy store because we get to look at anything you can think about. We have a very strong biomedical component, which is pretty um, mainly human and mouse uh, genomics. However, we do undertake a lot of agricultural and environmental projects. So for the bioinformatics of the team at the AGRF, um, we undertake two key roles which are equally important. We respond to client needs in terms of analysis. So we undertake um, primary analysis, which is fundamentally quality control of the raw data. So any data that leaves the AGRF goes through my team for quality control. And this is crucial when you think that underpinning every aspect of analysis is quality control. You have to be completely confident of the quality of your data before you can make any inferences from it. We also undertake a substantial amount of secondary analysis. So these are standard analyses that are commonly requested. So for example, expression studies. And we also undertake tertiary work. So these are uh, complex or custom analyses. Our second main role is to act as core support for teams within the AGRF. So we support the next generation sequencing team, the genotyping team, the Sanger sequencing team. Bizarrely, Sanger sequencing is still incredibly popular despite having been around for decades, and we do uh, a substantial amount of research and development. So the one thing I was asked to sort of focus on is what's the difference between how we, as a, as a sort of a commercial enterprise, treat our relationship with bioinformatics and open source software versus an academic institution? And actually, it's not very different at all. We use pretty much the same software, so the same approaches, as most of it operates under a not-for-profit license. But there are two areas where we, as a, as a commercial entity, do differ from an academic approach to bioinformatics analysis. So firstly, we have established, run, and maintain a number of pipelines for commonly requested analyses. This is really mass-produced bioinformatics analysis. 
So we aim to put these pipelines together that address common needs, so things that we were asked on a very routine basis. We aim to have turnaround as fast as possible. So this is mass produced, but with an accurate and best practice approach and reproducible analysis. So this differs from an academic approach where you'd have more specific tailored analysis. This is really, this is mass production um, bioinformatics analysis. The second main area that we differ from, say, an academic approach is that a number of our processes have on, undergone accreditation certification. And so all of our bioinformatics analyses need to sit within this framework. There are three main areas where we have accreditation. We're accredited as the Lumina Certified Service Provider. So this is really with regard to providing high quality data for genetic analysis applications. We're certified for Agilent Technologies, so here specifically for targeted enrichment. And most importantly, the AGRF has undergone accreditation from the National Association of Testing Authorities. So we have internationally recognized quality standards, and all of our analysis needs to fit within this framework. So bioinformatics is an incredibly exciting area to be in today. I was, one of the things I was asked about was the motivation to get into bioinformatics, which for me is easy because it's just, it is just awesome. There is so much interesting stuff going on at the moment. It's charging on ahead. Um, the estimated average growth rate is about 21%, and this growth is primarily being driven by developments in the field of genomics. And the main issue that's changing genomics is next generation sequencing. So this nice paper was published in 2008 in Nature Bi Biotechnology, which said, what would you do if you could sequence everything? And it was fairly hypothetical, but we've got to the stage now where we really can sequence everything. The technology's changed, the cost is plummeting. It's now affordable and an option to sequence pretty much everything. So the current market for next generation sequencing is dominated by Illumina. I think I read somewhere that of the sequence data that's publicly submitted, about 90% of it came off an Illumina machine, and they have about 74% market share. And historically, with the, with the Illumina ecosystem, there have been no open source efforts. It's all proprietary. So the sequencing machine is, was proprietary, and the software that they released to work with their data was also proprietary. However, this has changed in the fairly recent history. Uh, they've released a software called BaseSpace, which is their genomics computing environment for next generation sequencing analysis and management. This can be accessed via Linux-based command line interface, so they are bringing it uh, more toward, making it more appealing for people with a programming background. They provide the ability where you can either write private or public applications to work within it. So you can write a private application which is just for yourself or just for your organization. Or you can write a public application which you can allow anyone to use and you can decide whether or not you charge for use of this application. And Illumina provide an API and SDKs for developing and promoting applications to sit within base space. And within the next generation sequencing community, there's a new kid on the block, Oxford Nanopore, who have significantly changed the face of sequencing and how it interacts uh, in really in a, in a much more open environment. For, uh, to, to participate in this, all you need to do is pay $1,000 and you can get a sequencer. So the image there shows the MinIron sequencer. You can see it's a, a really small portable sequencer. So if your access fee, you get one of those shipped through the post to you and you get membership of their community. The community is incredibly active. They have um, a website with massive amounts of accurate and well-maintained documentation. They have weekly phone conferences where you can um, phone in and listen to everyone who's actively developing in this field at the moment. And the really interesting approach with how Oxford Nanopore are putting forward their sequencing technologies, they really are working hand in hand with, the, with an open community to continuously improve the product. Not only in terms of the sequencing consumables, but the actual technology and the software that goes into analyzing the data. So um, Oxford Nanopore have been working with the, with the open community for ever since they released their sequencer. 
and it's uh, an incredibly dynamic and highly evolving area, and this has led to about 19 open source tools being released in about two years, which is very rapid uh, for the next generation sequencing area. And these are just three that um, are commonly used, which are available either on GitHub or SourceForge, and have, um, are being actively developed by this community. So it's, um, it's a really interesting way of a sequencing provider getting involved with its users. So if you've got next generation sequencing data, so a standard, a standard sequencer can produce about a terabyte of data per run. And the, the, the sort of the raw output looks a bit like this. So you've got millions of lines like this, and you have to work through that, transform that into something which will give you a tangible and useful outcome. So how do you go about analyzing that sort of data? Well, really, from the beginning, it's, there's been this um, sentiment among bioinformaticians that, and I'm here I'm really talking about the bioinformaticians who build, implement, and apply software tools. Bioinformatics is a very broad discipline, and not everyone necessarily actually writes software tools. But that free open source software is the noble thing to do. So for bioinformatics, open source software has always been the rule rather than the exception. So how does the AGF go about choosing what software to use? Well, we go through the literature and we discuss with our peers what's currently considered to be best practice for whatever method we're currently trying to analyze. We look to see if the software has been published, and if so, what in, what's the context. We try to get software that actually works. I know this does sound obvious, but no end of tools are published with substantial glitches. We work with software predominantly that's reasonably current. Uh, usually, usually, newer means better. We look to see if the tool's being maintained. So was it the work, for example, of a student who put it together for his PhD and then hasn't touched it since? Or is it being actively maintained by a team? And we actually, we look at the pedigree of the tool. So for open source software, the majority of the most innovative and the most popular tools, it still is open source software. And this is predominantly tools which have been developed by academic researchers. And Tools that are released with the free-to-use open source license confer a number of advantages on it. So primarily, it means it's rapidly adopted by the research community, so you get this rapid establishment of a strong user base. Because it's open source, this encourages community source code improvements and support for the tool, and it enables incorporation and expansion into other tools and pipelines. So it gets very quickly gets strong uptake and strong usage. And if you make a tool available with an open source license, then it assists in promoting and advertising your tool because you can host it somewhere like SourceForge that people are, are familiar with and um, happy to use. So this has really taken off, and pretty much every language you can think of, you sort of pick your favorite language, will have a bio project associated with it. And there's actually even an Open Bioinformatics Foundation who've been established primarily to promote and support the development of open source software for the biological research community. And here I've listed just seven of the bio projects that they're currently actively supporting and maintaining. So if you're going to release uh, bioinformatics software, so for good bioinformatics software, it needs to be maintained, supported, and improved to remain competitive and useful. Bioinformatics is an incredibly rapidly evolving field. Um, your software needs a lot of tender loving care if it's going to be maintained and, and remain usable. So this, this need means that it can be quite a burden for developers. So if you're an academic, it takes time away from developing new tools or for writing grants and publishing papers. It consumes your time. And if you release a software tool with an open code, this allows your competitors to see exactly how you achieve this, and they can then incorporate this information into their own competing tools. And with most open source licenses, it also means commercial entities can modify and adapt your code into a product that they can then sell for a profit. Um, and we do commonly see this with a number of NGS software providers. So for example, the statistical programming language R is incorporated in a lot of software, which is subsequently sold. So the one example I'm going to give here, which is to give you an idea of um, how onerous um, really the academic community can find providing uh, open source software is from the Bioconductor project, which is the source of packages written for the statistical programming language R. They're written for genomics analysis. 
This is for an annotation package for the Illuma, Illumina Human Methylation Array. And if you go through their documentation and you look up one of the keywords, this is what you find. So this is a description that this man's put under the keyword Illumina Human Methylation 45K Blame. This answers the important question of where to point the finger when it turns out that an annotation is out of date. It comes with a free money-back guarantee. Your purchase price will be refunded. And the details for this are typically it will be an overworked and underprepared grad student or RA. So you can get an idea of the mindset of this guy when he finally got around to publishing this tool, how, how onerous he'd found uh, developing and maintaining this software. So this is where we come to the biggest problem with open source bioinformatics. That it's predominantly written by non-programmers, um, really mainly academic researchers. So I was having a discussion the other day with a team member who I would say is a pure programmer, he's a Python, uh, he's been doing Python for decades. We were going through a piece of um, uh, software that we wanted to use and he literally put his head in his hands in frustration because of the inconsistencies and the poor practice with it. The problem with um, software written by non-programmers, well really with academics, is academics are time poor, they don't have the time to put into maintaining and loving a piece of software. The, with non-programmers, there are inconsistencies in the code, so for example, in the naming structure, and software is often released lacking dependencies that it hasn't been formally tested. So I'd say here, this is where bioinformatics desperately needs pure programmers who can come and, um, and, and solve some of the issues that we're currently working with. Um, I'd say if you're interested in bioinformatics, you'd be welcomed with open arms. And if you do think this is a career change for you, then it's very easy to get into. All you need to do is find a practical problem and solve it. So all of the bio projects that I previously alluded to would, would be delighted to uh, have a programmer in, the, in their group who was interested in bioinformatics. And there are a number of really good projects around at the moment that you can easily get involved in. The two examples I put here are Google Summer of Code and the Avados project. And I'd say that if you're really interested in bioinformatics and open source, you can actually buy the book. And uh, this was released by a bioinformatician in mid last year and focuses on reproducible and robust research with open source tools. So I'd just like to acknowledge the five nodes that host the HRF. So we're hosted by the University of Queensland, the University of Adelaide, Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research in Perth, Autonomizer Hall Institute, and the Westmead Millennium Institute in Sydney. And I'd like to acknowledge that we received funding from NCRIS and Bioplatforms Australia. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lavinia. Now, any questions? I've talked to some friends in CSRO in various science fields and this seems to be a fairly common problem that the researchers and scientists don't necessarily have the programming skills but they do have big problems that could be greatly helped. Have you seen many of the scientists been trying to sort of encourage involvement in many fields yet? Have I seen many of the... Scientists like, scientists like yourselves trying to encourage involvement from programmers and open source people more and more? Like is this an ongoing problem in all the fields? Um, yes, I'd say so. So we encourage we encourage programmers to get into it, but it's um, the scientists have got the motivation and the interest, but they don't really have the skill, or they don't have the, the, the pure skills to perfect it. So they do hacky code, which kind of gets the job done, but as soon as you transfer it to someone else, it falls over. Um, to get a to get a pure programmer in is to get them motivated, to get them interested in the problem. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting. Um, uh, events occurring at the moment, like health hack, where you where you try and get the two groups of people together to really elucidate a problem. Um, so it's definitely taking off. But I'd say also the one issue is programmers are in demand, and the funding in science isn't as good as say funding for maybe working for a bank. So to try and and get the two to connect is a bit tricky. I mean, we welcome programmers, and uh, some of the, my best team members are pure programmers. But, Yes, yes, yeah, you've got to get people excited about the problem, yeah. Yep. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, if you can get someone interested, then then that's your driver. Hi, uh, I'm from the neuroscience field. I have two questions, maybe not the questions, just a. The first is that, what do you mean by raw data? Is it the imaging data or sort of data is that? That's the first. And second question is that, because I reckon you must be having a lot of data, how you're managing that data <laughs> after generating it? Um, so for managing, I'd say probably by the skin of our teeth, we're usually around 90% capacity. It's a, const it's a constant thing that we are revising storage mechanisms uh, updating our infrastructure, it's, it's just an ongoing task. As soon as we get more space from our uh, technology group, uh, we fill it up pretty much. Um, and, I, and as far as I'm aware, that's the case throughout the world. In every group I know who's working in this field is pretty much at 90% capacity. Um, and it, that's just the way it's going to go, and we're just going to have to keep buying new hardware, really, to fill it up with. I don't know, because I'm from the University of Melbourne, I think. Uh they are running a project called Daris, and there is a lot of XNet sort of management of the data, where the, you have a data and metadata collecting together, and it's easy to fish and provide people straight away, all those sort of uh, uh, infrastructure. Because as you said that, I don't think, I mean, I personally don't think that buying new hardware will, will keep helping us, because one day it's again going to pull, and that's the same case with me in my team, that we are almost reaching to a tipping point where we can't support any more hardware. Yeah, so. um, I mean, there's methods being developed, actively developed at the moment for compression of data. So uh, people have revisited the original way sequence data has been stored in BAM formats. Um, the tool is CRAM, which is undergoing some significant developments. And that might lead to some major improvements on how we can store the data. There's a question of what do you actually need to store? Uh, we're very conservative. We store the really raw data, so we can always go right back to the beginning. Um, and just touching briefly on the thing of raw data, so that's, you're right, that's not the raw, raw data. You could say the raw data is the actual intensities, or uh, you know, more from an image perspective. But the, the, really, for most of the technologies that we're talking about, so Illumina, PacBio, the algorithms developed for transforming that into confident base calls are fairly well advanced, so we don't tend to dabble in that. I'm not so concerned about that. It's the downstream tools that we tend to focus on. So managing data is obviously hard, but my question is, how are you managing the metadata? Um, uh -huh. yes, that's another good question. So most of it's not our responsibility because it's client data. Um, we have a few arrangements, so for example, the EBI metagenomics portal, where they're trying very hard to get people to submit their data and to have relevant metadata associated with it, so collection points, um, um, species, or uh, we do a lot of um, array and sequence submission where it's the tissues that we use, the protocols that we use in um, extracting the tissues, those sort of things. So there are initiatives underway, but it's nobody can force people to do this. So it's just trying to encourage it and make it easy to do. It's fairly onerous to put together a great big list of all of your metadata. Um, we were involved in a very large um, soil collection project. About 1,600 samples were collected. And there we actually had GPS locations of where they were collected, the environment, the surroundings, all that sort of information. But there was a whole team of people who put that information together. So it's definitely an interest and a motivation to do it, but it's quite a lot of work. People tend to think about it when they go to publish, which is you know two years after they did the experiment. So. Any more questions? Okay, okay then. <laughs> yeah, so we'll move along.